So we have the lights on here, or is it, uh, is it like this? You saw the lights on? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, the lights. I think the lights can go on. Anyway, we're going to have a little bit uh, hard pressed for time, so we have to start the award ceremony here. And again, it's my pleasure to present these awards. Uh, the review process was pretty stringent. And we have some uh, uh, really great people here, very, very notable people, as you'll see. So we will start uh, our first award with uh, the Excellence in Research in Applied Mathematics to Alfred Caruso. Alfred, uh, nominated, who's a nominee? Uh, I think uh, he, that award is going to be, uh, the nominator is uh, Ron Wuwe from and he's going to speak briefly about uh, Alfred's achievements, and then Alfred has about three minutes to give you a talk. <laughs> okay, um, uh, so I'm Ron, Ron Boisvert. I'm chief of the Applied and Computational Math Division at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and it's my Pleasure to uh, talk about uh, Alfred Caruso. So, uh, Dr. Dr. Caruso's journey to Washington was a very circuitous one. Uh, it started in Alexandria, Egypt, where he was born. I'm going way back, I'm giving you the complete story. Um, then proceeded to Adelaide, Australia, where he received a bachelor's degree in physics. And then he traveled to Madison, Wisconsin, where he um, received a master's degree in meteorology. Uh, and then finally a PhD in mathematics where he focused on those partial differential equations that he seemed to be encountering everywhere uh, during, his, during his studies. He then went on to Albuquerque to an academic position at the University of New Mexico. Um, but always seeking new and challenging problems to work on, he also um, was a frequent visitor at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And you'll, you'll see that uh, there are still vestiges of New Mexico in him when he, when he comes up here. You can see his, see his tie that he's wearing. But in uh, 1982, he found his true home when he became a staff member at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in NIST. And that was really fortunate for us because Dr. Carrasso's passion has been the solution of so-called inverse problems, which are really the bread and butter of a measurement lab like, like NIST. Uh, a classic inverse problem is determining a previous temperature distribution from thermal measurements that are made at a later time. So in, in essence, that means that one, one must solve the heat equation backwards in time to find out uh, the previous state of the system. On the surface, this just and looking at the equations, it looks like this is this is an easy thing to do. You know, it doesn't look any harder going backwards than forwards. But uh, if you understand that the underlying process is diffusion, which is an averaging process that inevitably results in loss of information as you go on, you can really understand that integrating backwards in time is, in a sense, impossible. Mathematicians use the polite term ill-posed for such, for such <laughs> problems. And um, heroic attempts to solve them are called deconvolution. Uh, these are really among the most challenging prob mathematical problems that there are to solve. Uh, and just throwing a bigger computer at them won't help. You really have to be smarter, not just have more muscle. Um, Dr. Carrasso has been remarkably successful in solving such impossible problems, applying a deep understanding of mathematical principles along with an experimentalist drive to forge ahead in spite of conventional wisdom. At NIST, one of the applications that Dr. Carrasso has focused on is the problem of image deblurring. Here, the blur is not caused just by being out of focus like you might see if you're a bad uh, photographer like I am, but um, it's really through a diffusion process much like the, the heat equation, that is present when you capture images with advanced systems like scanning electron microscopes or astronomical telescopes. Dr. Carrasso's techniques for modeling such instruments using log logarithmic and fractional, fractional diffusion equations, as well as his novel techniques for the efficient and stabilized integration of these equations for short periods backwards in time, 
have led to really remarkable crisp reconstruction of images from the nanoscale up. In fact, um, his deconvolutions of Hubble Space Telescope imagery are really stunning and significantly bring out the um, detail and visual data that's not really apparent in the original images. In the, in the past few years, Dr. Grasso has set his sights on a goal that has up to now eluded mathematicians, solving the hard, highly nonlinear Navier-Stokes equations of fluid mechanics backwards in time. He has already made really amazing progress there, developing and demonstrating efficient, stabilized solution techniques for the time reverse problems that have previously been considered out of reach. Dr. Carrasso's prodigious mathematical abilities, his deep insight, and his persistence are breaking through barriers in our understanding of the solution of partial differential equations uh, that are of universal application. It's truly fitting that we honor him with an award for excellence in research in applied mathematics. I am proud to know Dr. Alfred Carrasso, and it's my pleasure to present him to you. I want to thank my colleagues for nominating me to this prestigious award, and I want to draw attention to the uh, exceptional environment of my institute, which is uh, especially conducive to innovation and discovery. Long may it last. Less time than to solve all the partial differential equations. Uh, our next awardee is uh, Nader Moyori. Uh, he's from NIST, and uh, this is the Excellence in Research in Computer Science Award. And uh, he, uh, his nominator is not here, but Chuck uh, Romain, who is the director of ITL, will be uh, giving a short speech on uh, Nader. Thank you very much. Uh, Nader's division chief who nominated him, unfortunately, was unable to be here uh, tonight. But I am thrilled to be able to uh, fill in and to tell you a little bit about the extraordinary uh, career and capabilities of, uh, of Nader Moyeri. Uh, he received his PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Michigan in 1986. That was a great year to get a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he's worked on many basic and applied research problems over the past 33 years. Uh, there are several examples I want to uh, talk about uh, briefly today. Uh, one of them involves uh, communication channels. Um, today, it's routine for communications uh, technologies to adapt to uh, different, different conditions. If the conditions are bad, then the adaptation takes place that, uh, that creates more resiliency to channel errors. Uh, if the conditions are good, then the adaptation takes place to emphasize uh, a greater throughput. Um, when he started uh, working on this problem, that kind of adaptation, uh, those mechanisms did not exist. And so uh, with his uh, PhD student, uh, Hong Chen Wang, uh, they developed a finite state Markov channel model uh, for time varying channels uh, and that uh, induced this kind of uh, adaptation mechanism. That work paved the way for analysis and design of new wireless communication systems uh, that are more adaptable and these are things that we take for granted today. Um, but now with their paper having been cited more than 1800 times, and trust me, for those of you who are not scientists, that's a big number. Uh, their 1995 paper is regarded as seminal work uh, in this uh, wireless technology that is, uh, that is in, in wide use today. Um, I could talk about many other things, but I'm actually going to uh, pivot to the last thing to give uh, Nader a little more time to, uh, uh, to give his, uh, his acceptance speech. Um, in the last 10 years, uh, he's tackled a really uh, critical problem, and it is testing indoor localization. And I don't know if you've really thought about just how challenging this is. Um, some of you may have had the same experience that I had. When I grew up, 
my telephone was actually attached to the wall. I know this is really strange, right? And, and I used to answer it even if I didn't know who was calling. I don't know how I'm still, still alive. But, um, but at any rate, um, there's something comforting in that in the sense that the phone company knew exactly where you were and where you were calling from. So if you dialed 911 from a landline, those, those archaic things that we used to have, um, they were able to pinpoint exactly where you were and they would come to your location. Well, think about today, if you are on a cell phone and you dial 911, there is a certain amount of information about your whereabouts that you get through GPS and through other, through other mechanisms if you're using my fine zone. But the fact is, the folks who are responding to that 911 call may not really have a very strong indication of exactly where you are. And in particular, if you're in a multi-story building, a high rise or a building that has you know, more than one or two floors, uh, they may actually be able to pinpoint the building, perhaps. But think about how long it takes to search you know, 96 floors trying to find where in the, where in the world the person who dialed 911 and then passed out uh, is. In fact, uh, estimates are, according to the FCC, 10,000 people die every year in the United States when they call 911 using their cell phones and the emergency responders are unable to get to them because they don't have sufficient accuracy uh, information. I don't think there are too many other uh, problems that are as important to work on than trying to save 10,000 people's lives every year. Um, the problem is that localization technologies are really, really challenging to develop. And in particular, they have to be tested. And they have to be tested uh, rigorously. Uh, NIST, uh, I should have said, by the way, <laughs> I'm the director of the Information Technology Laboratory at NIST, uh, which is uh, long may it live, right, <laughs> according to Al. Um, and so uh, it really makes a difference if you can test these new technologies for, for localization. But testing is not so trivial. You actually have to put together a remarkable uh, test bed and, and, and environment in which you can do the testing. And you have to have rigorous protocols. And those are really, really challenging and require a lot of standardization, a lot of effort. And so Nader has been working on this for more than a decade now, uh, in particular working with the ISO IEC standardization uh, of uh, 18305. Uh, this is an international standard uh, building a test bed. He has built a test bed consisting of five large buildings on the NIST campus that are exquisitely instrumented, very, very carefully measured distances so that he can test uh, and others can test that, uh, those technologies. Uh, so he's been uh, undertaking that testing for a number of years now and we're really, really grateful uh, that his work is facilitating uh, better systems for indoor localization and allowing uh, users of such systems uh, to know what it is that they're actually buying. So uh, tremendous work uh, on the part of Nader Moyari, and it's, I'm very proud and privileged to be able to introduce you to him uh, for this prestigious award. So Nader, please. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. In two minutes, you want to work on the track, as you know. He'll actually give the same uh, in-depth talk to each of his 400 people. He knows <laughs> every one of them an in-depth. <laughs> Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Chuck, for that uh, very kind uh, introduction. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am truly honored to uh, receive an Excellence in Research Award from the uh, Washington Academy of Sciences. Uh, I'm grateful to the Academy and its award committee for uh, this recognition. I thank my division chief, uh, Dr. Abdullah Batu, for his support for my work and for uh, nominating me for uh, uh, this award. Unfortunately, uh, Abdullah could not be here uh, this evening. 
over the past 32 years, uh, since the receipt of my PhD, I uh, have had the privilege of working with many great people. Uh, they have contributed as much, if not more, to anything I have achieved uh, in research. Uh, this award would have not been possible without their uh, contributions. I have had the privilege of working uh, for three uh, great institutions uh, over these uh, years. A, a tier one uh, research university, a prestigious uh, industrial research laboratory, and NIST, which has been the greatest of the, the three. And I have spent twice as much time, time at uh, NIST as uh, the other two institutions combined. I thank our laboratory director, uh, Dr. Charles Romine, uh, for creating the environment that makes all the great work that comes out of our uh, information technology laboratory uh, possible. Thank you for giving us uh, much latitude in pursuing our research and trusting us uh, that uh, we remain uh, focused on the NIST uh, mission and what uh, this institution is all about. I thank my wife of, uh, and partner for the past uh, 25 years, uh, uh, Elham Tabassi, she's sitting over there. Uh, for uh, standing by me and uh, for her uh, sage advice. Thank you all. Our, our next award is uh, Excellence, excellence in Research in Mathematics and Computer Science. And this is to Bonita V. Saunders from NIST. And uh, we'll ask uh, Michael to give the introduction to us. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. I am uh, Michael Donahue. I'm the leader of the Mathematical Software Group at NIST. I've known Dr. Bonita Saunders since I joined the math division somewhat over 20 years ago now. There are many aspects of Benita's work that I could present today. I could talk about her, her pioneering work in the field of automatic grid generation, which is a critical first step in solving partial differential equations, which we heard about earlier. Or I could talk about her more recent work uh, in collaboration with the University of Antwerp in uh, producing high position tables of mathematical functions with guaranteed accuracy uh, primarily for use for in testing for uh, mathematical software. But undoubtedly, her biggest impact <coughs> has been in her role as a visualization editor for the Digital Library of Mathematical Functions, the DLMF. The DLMF is the 21st century successor to a very famous work called the Handbook of Mathematical Functions by Abramowitz and Stegen. I suspect that many people in this audience are familiar with this work. It, has become, it was the uh, standard reference for mathematical special functions since its publication in 1964. There are over a million copies of that work in print, and it is the most highly cited work out of NIST in the history of NIST. And in fact, it's likely that it's the most widely cited work in all of the mathematical literature. The DLMF is not simply an expansion of that handbook, however. It's a fundamental redesign from the ground up using current technology to make the material with them more accessible. The most visually obvious difference between the DLMF and the handbook are the visualizations. Whereas the handbook uh, had only a handful of uh, black and white line drawings, the new DLMF has over 800 color illustrations. Many of these are 3D visualizations, and they're, just not, they're not just 3D, but also interactive. If you go to the dlmf.mist.gov on your uh, browser or your cell phone that I know everyone here has, you can pull up these, uh, these uh, illustrations and you can actually rotate them. So you can see what the mathematical objects look like from all different directions. You can pass a plane through to get what cross-sectional view is. You can rescale the axis. It's really quite amazing. Um, but this goes beyond the aesthetics. There's no faster way to grasp uh, complex technical information than through a good visualization. However, putting together one good visualization for these sorts of functions is very difficult, much less putting together over 800 of them. Uh, they're especially difficult because many of the functions in mathematics are not well behaved. They have very sharp asymptotes or deep crevices. And trying to compute these accurately and rendering them is a very difficult challenge. 
And it's here that Benita's background in grid generation and mathematical uh, function calculation really came to, came to bear fruit. Uh, I also want to note, though, that in addition to having these, um, these graphs displayed accurately, it's also important to figure out how, what information to, to display and how to do so. It's really almost an artistic problem. It's trying to figure out how to display this information in a way which the fundamental truth of these objects comes through. It's hard to overstate the importance of the DLMF. Uh, the American Mathematical Society notices calls the DLMF a treasure for the mathematical and scientific community. Uh, Mathematics Today writes that the DLMF has achieved perfection. And the visualizations in the DLMF are, are a large part of that. Uh, before I conclude, though, I also want to point out Benita's outstanding uh, record of service. She's held positions with the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics, SIAM, as well as MAA, Mathematical Association of America. She's been on the advisory board for several local universities. And she's also mentored many students, including at-risk elementary students in the Alexandria school system through a program that she chairs, which is sponsored by the Alexandria Boys and Girls Club. Benita's work stretches, we see, her impact is stretched from school kids in Alexandria to scientists around the world. And so it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Benita Saunders as the winner of this year's Excellence in Research in Mathematics and Chemistry. <laughs> Sciences for this great honor. It was a very uh, big surprise to me, and uh, I, I really appreciate it. But uh, I also want to thank uh, NIST. I want to thank my supervisor, Mike, Mike Donahue, and I also want to, want to thank my division chief, uh, Ron Boisbert. It's important, like uh, Al Carrasso said, to have an environment that allows you to do this type of research. And at NIST, I've, I've found that. And it's, it's been a wonderful experience for me. It's, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, one of my cousins teaches, uh, teases me and says, uh, you never hear anybody say they love their job. Benita loves her job. <laughs> <laughs> I love my job at NIST. I've been, been there for over 29 years, and to tell you the truth, it's, it's been beyond my wildest dreams. And growing up in, in the South, uh, going to segregated schools, a lot of the things I do at NIST, I, I never could have imagined at that, at that time. And I, I mean, it's, it's been amazing. You know, I've been able to go to countries that I, I never thought I would see, or even thought of seeing. And I've been able to do research with uh, mathematicians and computer scientists and engineers from all over the, the world. And I've gone to conferences with, and worked with, with these people. And ironically, in a few days, I'll be going to Antwerp, Belgium for a month to work on a, a collaboration project with somebody, uh, with Annie Kite at the University of Antwerp. And it's ironic because my first foreign trip at NIST was actually to Bel Belgium. So it's like I've come full, full circle. So I, I really appreciate my experience at NIST. And, uh, but the only thing is, I, I wish there were uh, more African Americans there. Uh, <laughs> it, it's a great place, but it, it's, of course, it's not a, a perfect place. And that explains my other passion, working with underprivileged kids at uh, a Boys and Girls Club in Alexandria. And I've done that for several years and, and chaired it for, uh, for many years, probably about 10 years. 
And the interesting thing about the program is I get some of the same kids who come back year after year. So I have one, one uh, child who started the program in the third grade and he's now in the seventh grade. And I would say he's, he's brilliant in mathematics, but the, the kids and even the, uh, the parents don't understand the importance of uh, an education or, or the, you know, being, having a career or the, or the, the viability of, of a career in the mathem mathematics and, and sciences. Uh, even the, the club officials, they push athletics and they've discovered that he's a, a, a great basketball player. And he, um, they, they actually, when I wasn't in class a couple of times, they actually pulled him out of the class to, to play basketball on the basketball team. And, and it's very frustrating to see how bright he is. And if you ask him what he wants to do, what his career will be, he says, I want to be a basketball player. So I'm still working on him. And I, I, <laughs> I, I talked to his mother, and uh, I invited him to the scholarship banquet that my sorority has. And I, I talked with him, and I said, OK, you know, I don't want to discourage him. I said, uh, basketball career is one option, but it's just one. At this stage in your life, you should be looking at a variety of options. You, you, you never know what's going to happen. You, you don't know how you change as you, as you grow or whether you will be able, able to make uh, a career of it. And besides, it's a, uh, it, it, it's a short career. You know, your 30s, you know, maybe your 40s, you know, if, if you like it. And of course, he's very smart. Well, oh, this player is playing, he's in his 40s. Yeah, okay. But <laughs> you gotta be quick. So, so I said, but I know you like money. I said, because uh, I give the kids uh, money incentives for, for their work. And I said, maybe you don't want to be a mathematician, but maybe you want to go into marketing. And uh, I said, you know, uh, I'm getting him yet. So maybe you, you can go uh, that direction. So he's listening. And I said, and I also have a story for you. A friend of mine had an uncle who was a star basketball player at the University of Maryland. But he got hurt, and he wasn't able to, uh, to, to, to go into the pros uh, as a basketball player. But this kid was smart enough to get his uh, bachelor's degree in business and went on to, to get an MBA. Uh, he ended up working at Nike, and he actually represented Michael Jordan. <laughs> so I said, he became a millionaire that way. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, you really have to work hard, but you see kids like this and you see how much potential they have and you know they too could be great scientists or mathematicians or, or whatever. And uh, so I hope, and, and the other thing is, this isn't just an African American problem. It, it goes across all ethnic groups, you know, white, black. It, uh, in, in the U.S., we need more scientists, you know. I go to conferences overseas, and I can see the number of Americans at these conferences going down over the years. So this is something that's important for all of us. Thank you. By the way, along with your award certificates, plaques, you're also going to get a fellowship. So you are. Uh, inducted into the Washington Academy of uh, Sciences as a fellow uh, for this offer all the award is today. Uh, our next uh, award goes to Peter Bosch for the leadership in health informatics. Uh, his uh, nominator could not be here, so uh, I actually printed a document about him, but I lost it somewhere. Here. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to do a very short introduction. For, for those people who may have lost the thing, but I tried to retrieve it here anyway on my iPhone uh, in the last two minutes. That's why we have the iPhone, where is me? <laughs> now, Peter Bosch is now currently a senior director of IT quality and safety research and national IT, health IT policy at the MedStar Health, and is also a board of regent, uh, regents member at the ACP, which is American College of Physicians. Okay, that's his current status. However, what you should really know about Peter is that he was one of the pioneers about those electronic health records. Uh, this was before people even started. There are a few doctors here. I know that my wife is a doctor. She's there. Uh, they have terrible time using these EHRs. 
Actually, they're not blaming you, by the way, okay? Because you're just a pioneer in using EHRs. And Peter is very passionate about it. In fact, even Obama, I believe, has requested you to be on his uh, commission when they're doing this transition into EHRs. Uh, he's very passionate about electronic health records, but one of the things with these EHRs is that uh, basically most of the vendors try to sell it to the doctors and uh, somehow make them use these EHRs. But Peter says that there is more to EHR than just using it. There's a whole philosophy of how to use the electronic health record. It's not just the user interface. There's a lot of usability problems in there. But what Peter is trying to do is how can the doctor be extremely efficient in using this health, electronic health records. There's efficiency in there and not, not, uh, and not feel it as a burden. And that goes to the patients also. So he's working very hard towards that. Peter. Thank you very much, Ron, and uh, thank you for handling the introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. <laughs> First, uh, thank, uh, thank you to all, and thank you to the Academy. Uh, if I did my math correctly, this is the 80th year that the Academy has been recognizing merit in our scientific community, and I am humbled to be among those so honored by, the, by this august group. So what has it meant to be a leader in the field of healthcare informatics? <coughs> When I first started, as Ram said, leadership meant being a pioneer, being first. The risk of failure was so high that one of my very first mentors advised me that unless I was absolutely certain that I could be successful, it would be better to fail early. <laughs> yes, is failing, yes, he actually told me that. Is failing early was less costly in dollars and to one's reputation. A wiser mentor advised me not to be preoccupied with failure, as the consequences of failure, while unpleasant, were not that complicated. Far more important was preoccupation with success, as only then would it be possible to discover and perhaps even mitigate against unintended consequences. For example, uh, assume that electronic drug-drug interaction checking could be developed such that it could work at scale hundreds of thousands of times, millions of times a day. And only then could one easily foresee the new burden and safety issue, which is now known as alert fatigue. Informatics leadership became more sharply focused with the 2001 publication by the Institute of Medicine Crossing the Quality Chasm. Difficult and noble expectations were now set for health information technology in the areas of quality, safety, access, and affordability. One challenge I recall in particular, how quickly can we change the snail's pace from discovery to routine practice, often stated then as <coughs> 17 years from bench to bedside. Uh, with the passage of the High Tech Act, as Trump talked about with our, uh, with, uh, under President Obama, the role for leadership pivoted once again to include engagement in the worlds of healthcare policy and promotion. And I can tell you those aspects of, of my job were far more difficult than the science. Of course, the story doesn't end there. We have a few physicians in the room, I understand. So this will not come as a surprise to you. Uh, while electronic health records are now in near ubiquitous use, and we can see increasing evidence of their benefit, they are still not fulfilling their promise of consistently enabling better and safer care. And more worrisome, this technology solution to healthcare delivery inefficiency has become a new source of burden, distraction, and burnout, all of which, in my opinion, needs to be addressed and resolved as soon as possible. Two final points. When I first started in this field, conventional wisdom for adopting new technology was very conservative. Avoid being on what was called then the bleeding edge. I am grateful that my health system, Messer Health, was more thoughtful, allowing us both to demonstrate leadership. And lastly, I want to thank my wife, Leslie. I've been married 36 years. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a long time. For her support and patience with what I know would be less charitably described as my obsession.
to get this right. <laughs> so thank you all. Thank you. Our next award is again a leadership award. It's leadership in material science. Eric Swedberg is the winner of this award and uh, uh, is nominator. Uh, yeah, you're gonna make the presentation. Short introduction, three minutes. Actually, you're doing pretty good this time. People are <laughs> they're surprised. So Jonathan will have about maybe one minute extra. No, just kidding. Actually, it is about two and a half to three minutes. Okay, good. Short and okay, Jonathan. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce to you Eric Swedberg this evening. Eric is a highly accomplished material scientist whose research efforts at Seagate and at NIST help pave the way for the current generation of magnetic data storage media widely used in today's computers. He actually helped make the transition from longitudinal media where the magnetization lay in the plane of the disk to perpendicular media where the magnetization of the bits used to store the data are perpendicular to the plane. So I'd like to say a few more things about that time at NIST. It was during that time at NIST that I first met Eric and where we began a very fruitful collaboration on projects such as magnetic sensors, magnetic media like I've just described, and spintronic materials. I was brought in midway through one of Eric's projects to help with some controlled electrodeposition of magnetic nanocontacts. And Eric had me up to speed very quickly, and it was his particular talent to motivate by infe infectious enthusiasm, and it allowed him to hold your attention while explaining details of the project, and it really got me up to speed really quickly. On a personal level, it was one of those rare occasions where it seemed like after only a short time, I'd known Eric for many years. Since then, over the years that I've worked with Eric, I found him to be full of ideas, eager to collaborate widely, and generous in giving credit to others for projects that he leads. It's partly for this reason that I'm so happy to be here tonight to see Eric receive this prestigious award. So Eric moved on from his research accomplishments at Seagate and NIST to uh, work at the Academies of Science, uh, where he has helped um, promote science and engineering policy and communications. There, his prolific output includes more than a dozen commission studies, each leading to printed reports downloaded thousands of times on diverse subjects including corrosion science, uh, body armor, aerospace propulsion, optics and photonics, and nanotechnology, to name but a few. With these in mind, I believe this award is a fitting tribute to Eric's leadership in advancing material science and engineering, both in the laboratory and through his influence on policy. <coughs> I'd like to finish now by thanking the organizers of this event for Eric's award, and also for the event itself, which has been very nice, and by asking Eric to say a few words. you just heard. Uh, first, I want to thank my uh, nominators and especially John who is here and gave a great introduction. Uh, I'm also honored to be here tonight and grateful for the recipient of this 2019 Leadership in Material Science Award. 
Just as the Washington Academy of Sciences' purpose has been to encourage the advancement of science and to serve as the affiliation of Washington, D.C. area scientific societies, I uh, believe that it is through teamwork that both the research in the lab and in the policy setting process um, proliferates the most and uh, provides uh, effective advancement of science. And it was through teamwork in the lab, as we just heard, that I first got to know John Mallet, working together with him on junctions for ballistic magneto resistance. The relationship has endured, as we also heard, and that he ha we have produced many papers together on concepts that have slowly made their way into disk drives and allowed everybody to store more and more photos and movies that we are recording now, as well as doing computationally demanding research that we also heard during lunch, uh, such as storing data, for example, for the recent image of a black hole that needed half a ton of disk drives to store just the information. So there's clearly more work to do, and I just feel like a little cog in this puzzle. Um, as we also heard later, uh, I entered the policy area and it's been uh, equally amazing and rewarding. Each question within material science uh, and engineering is important and interesting. But the, for example, in the future of optics uh, and corrosion of balls are two examples. To understand how the light emitting diode enabled a device that could measure the blood oxygen level in sedated patients without taking a blood sample and doing chemical analysis each time but to just put this little clip on the patient's finger shows the power of science and engineering. And to realize that bolts in deep sea oil drilling are exposed to a complex and extremely varying environment and to understand how to protect them shows the importance of science and engineering and the policy questions surrounding it. So 10 years of such studies has passed in a blink. Nine, 1898, is a much longer time ago, but Alexander Graham Bell and Samuel Langley did something great then when they and the other founders set out to define the Washington Academy of Sciences. I hope there will be many more years for the Washington Academy of Sciences to continue to tick like the full clockwork it is. I'm very honored to be a cog, I mean, here tonight. <laughs> Uh, Judy here made uh, this uh, uh, the wine glasses with Washington Academy of Sciences, and apparently you cannot put it in the dishwasher because <laughs> <laughs> the material. Okay. We have so, and, we and this is to, to do. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And uh, I packed all the bodies to get one of these things. Please don't forget to take. Otherwise, Judy will feel very unhappy that he spent all the time and no one has taken it. And Eric, you'll also observe that you don't have a folder. And the reason being that you're already a fellow of the academy. <laughs> so, cheers. Uh, our next award is uh, Leadership in Computer Science. And uh, this goes to John Cawfold. Uh, John Cawfold, uh, nominator, I guess, is Jim. Is Jim here? Yeah, Jim. OK, Jim is going to introduce John. Good evening, Washington Academy of Sciences members, fellows, and guests. I am pleased to have the honor of recognizing Dr. John Caulfield as a Washington Academy of Sciences fellow and for his leadership in data sciences. I've worked closely with John for more than 12 years in his efforts to advance data science and computer sciences in school STEM programs. We were part of a team that created the first Governor's STEM Academy or Career and Technical Academy in Virginia in 2008. During much of his career, John has worked in image data sciences in the public sector or in consulting roles for government clients. More recently, however, Dr. Caulfield's efforts have transformed the industry through his new award-winning company, Deep Learning Analytics, his small and diverse team, which also boasts more than 50% women, and most recognized data scientists in the Washington region, has revolutionized image data collection and analysis through machine learning and deep learning in support of military personnel, plant and animal bio threat analysis, and citizen science for educators and naturalists. Throughout the development of his new initiatives, John has continued to participate in the community through analysis of school, excuse me, dropout risk factors and advancing career and technical education through integration with a wide variety of education, workforce, and community building projects. 
john also previously served multiple terms as an officer of the washington academy of sciences he has an uncommon command of the intersections of government business academic and industry collaboration and is skilled at developing and advancing pilot projects and other initiatives he accomplishes all that he does without casting a shadow and instinctively recognizes assembles and facilitates opportunities for highlighting others' work. Indeed, most of his team is with him here tonight. Mm -hmm. John. Sciences. Thank you for that, Jim, and thank you also, Jim, for your commitment to uh, STEM education in Virginia, running the Think Good Labs. Um, also, uh, thank you, President Chris Brady of General Dynamics Mission Systems, who's here tonight. Um, this is the company that acquired Deep Learning Analytics uh, in March. And also, thank you, Lisa Finneran, my new boss, uh, Vice President of Engineering, here from General Dynamics as well. So uh, I want to thank the Washington Academy of Sciences uh, Selection Committee for this unexpected and humbling recognition. As former secretary of the academy, I was incredibly proud to serve alongside so many accomplished women on the board of managers. Terrell Erickson, followed by Mina Isaju, uh, uh, and then Sue <coughs> Cross, all served as president over my tenure as secretary. <coughs> and I'm hard to see Judy Stavely uh, is uh, the incoming president this year. Uh, during my tenure, Sally Rood led the charge to digitize all past issues of the Academy's journal back to the 1890s. That's how old this organization is. Uh, this was a huge undertaking and contribution to archive and preserve the oldest journal of its kind in the United States. Uh, Seth Ann Howard uh, has uh, served um, as the journal's editor and has served Washington Academy of Sciences in other leadership roles uh, for years before that. And a few years ago, she, she gave a keynote at this very uh, banquet. Uh, these are incredibly encouraging signs uh, to see anyone other than men serving in, uh, in in these roles as decision makers and influencers in these most august leadership roles in uh, science, leading the longest lived uh, academy of the United States. Uh, in 2019, the scientific community should still be as troubled by the ghost of Rosalind Franklin's crystallography image of the first double helix as much as it's heartened by the very public celebration of Katie Bowman's recent technical leadership and her reconstruction <laughs> of a black hole. Uh, the DARPA director, who approved the project that formed the seed capital for our deep learning analytics startup of women and men was Arthi Pravakar. Uh, at my new job at General Dynamics, uh, Lisa Finneran, um, who's with us here tonight, uh, will, will be speaking in Austin next week at the IEEE Women in Engineering International Leadership Conference. While these are not parody, uh, they're encouraging signs of uh, movement in the right direction toward a more meritocratic culture of science and engineering. I'm proud to accept this recognition on behalf of all of us at Deep Learning Analytics, and there's a lot of us here. Are you from Deep Learning Analytics? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jeremy, <laughs> Spinita. Um, uh, and uh, because this is really a recognition of our diverse and capable team at Deep Learning Analytics. This is a validation of our collective capabilities, technical culture, and tenacious pursuit of better performance in absolutely everything we've done. I'm thankful for every day I have the honor of working with this incredible team of data scientists, but I accept this recognition unqualified by gender diversity. I am not accepting this on behalf of the team with the most women or the team with the most gay, non-cisgendered, or some other team membership <laughs> qualification. I am simply accepting this on behalf of the team at Deep Money Analytics and they are being recognized for their successes among all other teams. Science, including data science, is a human pursuit by human beings, and we accept that culture and support of team dynamics are a core part of moving science forward. Our gender diversity of deep learning analytics and the essential cooperative nature of our team has been a differentiating advantage that has helped us overcome data science and machine learning challenges that other teams couldn't. Uh, the clearest signal of this team cohesion 
is that for five years, we have maintained a 0% attrition rate as a 12-person startup with half women, half men, and with gay and non-cisgender members. In that time, we were ranked one of the top four fastest growing companies in Arlington, Virginia, by revenue three years in a row. No other company has done that even twice. Um, this team's revenue growth, 0% attrition and gender composition in a highly attritive male-dominated tech space is vanishingly improbable. But deep learning analytic successes are just as improbable. The Washington Post saw, even saw fit to cover some of those because they were newsworthy. Um, I don't believe these two improbable things are a coincidence either. My hypothesis is we have been successful because we supported our diverse team and our diverse team created our successes in a positive feedback loop. Sadly, countless tech startups and unicorns in Silicon Valley have failed to protect the rights, livelihoods, and fortunes of women and those identifying with persecuted non cisgender groups at a moment when we need every last woman, child, and man to contribute in our economic, national, and scientific interests. I find these public and shameful failures incomprehensibly brutish, and though these same uniquely American technology organizations want to be identified as both the wizards and economic engines of our present day, they carry this heavy cultural burden from generations past that limits all our economic futures because it doesn't respect or foster gender diversity. That unmeritocratic culture of chauvinism, oppression, and abuse has no place in our economy and no place in science. As the primary external facing spokesperson for deep learning analytics recruiting and retention efforts, and as the executive who has reviewed the qualifications of every individual staff member since our founding, I've always viewed it as a professional obligation to never select for or select against gender or identification in or with any specific group. It's unmeritocratic whether selections are for walling in or for walling out. Those walls don't help science either way. For that reason, I can only conclude our organization's relative overrepresentation of women and those in the LGBTQIA community happens to be a byproduct of our selection for the best in their fields. Having stated my understanding of my professional obligation to meritocracy and fairness, I've also always personally hoped that deep learning analytics would be known in the machine learning community as a culture that's welcoming to all. I've hoped that women and those identifying with non cisgender groups would see fit to include us among the organizations they would consider to be identified with professionally. When I'm generous with our reputation in the local economy, both in the diverse DC data community of over 20,000, currently led by President Janet Dobbins, or in DC Femtech, currently led by Shannon Turner and Sheena Gwenzer, I allow myself to believe that those exceptional women and non cisgender scientists and engineers that have seen fit to choose deep learning analytics as a place to build their careers have done so precisely because they know we do not seek to unfairly advantage them, we will not tolerate their mistreatment, and we will not deny them opportunities afforded their peers. We are scientists and we believe in evidence. I'm incredibly proud of our team's unqualified commitment to diversity. When one of our scientists spoke in an out in tech event on data ethics, it was not just our LGBTQIA plus staff members uh, that attended. Everyone attended, gay, straight, male, female alike. When two of our data scientists were honored by DC Femtech, it was not only the women who showed up to support both Priyanka Oberoi, here tonight, uh, and Dr. Jennifer Sleeman, sitting right next to her. Um, that's got to be Dr. Jennifer Sleeman. <laughs> feel weird. Um, uh, all of us showed up, uh, both years. Advocacy for all of the team to bring the whole selves to their science is a team sport. The responsibility to foster that culture falls on all our shoulders, perhaps especially cisgendered men like myself, and not only on the weary shoulders of women and other genders who that role often falls to by default and unfairly. Dr. Jennifer Sleeman was the first data scientist I reached out to to ask if she'd consider joining the startup five years ago. And when I called, it was not because Dr. Sleeman was the most capable woman data scientist in my network. It was because she was the most capable data scientist in my network. My scientific beliefs are data-driven, so I'm always looking for hard evidence I can point to. Every publication needs a results section. This results section is about one of our interns. I can say I personally saw this intern struggle firsthand through some very technical challenges and come out victorious on the other end, not unlike the general trajectory of all the technical staff at 
DLA. Um, I heard a recent update on her professional career since her DLA internship. She's a junior at Cornell now. The news was she'd been doing machine learning for a big Wall Street bank on another internship, and they'd been so impressed with her work, they offered her a full-time job. It was great money and really good work, as, as I understood what the work was. Uh, but she ultimately turned it down. And she turned it down because she said she didn't see the same kind of supportive culture she'd seen at DLA. Understand, I didn't hear that the culture at this bank was toxic or deficient. She just explicitly recognized that there are places out there like DLA that can, can and will support her technical growth better. DLA was, for her, an existence proof, which is necessary but not sufficient, to generate a belief that a woman scientist can hold out for something better. It made my year to hear that she was holding out for something better, and I hope we all do. Thank you again on behalf of the team at Deep Learning Analytics for this unqualified recognition. Thank you, John. Congratulations again. Uh, our next uh, award is the Distinguished Career in Computer Science Award, and uh, this is this goes to Dinesh Manacha. Uh, I actually found my paper, Dinesh, but still, I'm not, <laughs> in the interest of time, I'm not going to read through this thing. Except I would like to say something. You just talked about deep analytics. Actually, what happened is around very, I think, early 1990s or so when the GPUs were just coming out, Dinesh was one of the pioneers of using that GPUs, which actually made deep learning possible in a sense. Wouldn't have without. Okay, <laughs> and not only that, Dinesh actually uh, is a very known computer scientist. He's at University, of, he's a chair professor at the University uh, of Maryland College Park, and some of you may be graduates of the University of Maryland College Park. He has about 500 research papers, and with an H index of over 100, and he is considered as one of the 80 top computer scientists in the entire world, maybe the universe, since we have this world part of it. And he has developed many very interesting systems in the virtual reality world for collisions and things like that. For those of you who have teenage kids and, and, and you wondered why they were wasting all this time playing these games, blame Dinesh for it. Because it's his software which has in those uh, uh, virtual, that those gaming systems in all the collision detecting algorithms and all can be traced to Dinesh. Dinesh? Can, uh, can you come forward to get your award? <laughs> He's a fellow of American uh, Association of Computing Machinery, IEEE, AAAS, and also the American Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. And above all, he's a jolly good fellow. <laughs> <laughs> for the kind words. Uh, good evening. It's really an honor to be here and uh, I really want to thank the committee for choosing me for such a distinguished award. Uh, looking at all the people and company I'm with, it's uh, really an honor to be here. Uh, I know it's getting late at night so I'll keep it short. First of all, you know, I've been in this field for more than 30 years and uh, all the things that Ram mentioned actually happened because I've always had wonderful collaborators. I had 40 PhD students and more than 100 collaborators all over the world. There's too many people, too many wonderful people who have been teaching me all the time, including all my new colleagues at the University of Maryland. And of course, uh, it's a lot of hard work. It's not possible without my family, including my wife and kids. So thank you very much for the wonderful honor, and I really appreciate everything that you've done. Thank you. It's a distinguished career in engineering, as you, and this award goes to Alton Rome, and uh, Guru will be introducing Alton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Guru Madhavan. I direct the National Academy of Engineering Programs. You're probably familiar with an engineer's knack. Uh, Al Romig's life has combined three versions of them. The first one, 
is an instinctual type, even an innate one. Of course, his dad was an engineer. Of course, he played with an erector set, model trains, and built simple machines practically around the time he was learning how to walk, and uh, eventually going on to build his own version of a cathode ray tube uh, for a sixth grade science fair, overachiever indeed. And uh, he later gained a professional inspiration from Oppenheimer, Werner von Braun, and John Kelly for a stellar engineering career that we are honoring today. The second knack is somewhat naturalistic containing a search for otherness, a curiosity that never rested to improve his own self and his profession. He was born in rural Pennsylvania, worked on farms, later falling in love uh, with the landscape and vivid colors of New Mexico. Ever fascinated by what birds do, a pigeon's walk or an owl's graceful takeoff that inspired his future work on stealth aircrafts blending materials and aerospace engineering, making him the leader of the world-renowned Lockheed Martin Advanced Development Program, better known as Skunkworks. Third, perhaps a crucial knack, is that of his concern for his colleagues and fellow citizens, the very attribute that made him successfully lead the Sandia National Labs, both as its chief technology officer and the chief operating officer several years later. The very attribute that makes me want to work for him, work with him, every day at the National Academy of Engineering, where he's the executive officer and chief operating officer, in advising the nation on key issues affecting engineering, technology, and policy. These three knacks are the one, two, three punch of Al Romick's incredible career in engineering. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm incredibly honored to introduce Dr. Alton D. Romick, Jr as the recipient of the Washington Academy of Sciences Distinguished Career Award in Engineering. Al, congratulations. It's a pleasure and an honor on behalf of uh, the Washington Academy Guru. I thank you all for the, your, the honor and pleasure of actually receiving this award tonight. It really has been something special. It was quite a surprise when I heard it. A couple of points I would like to make tonight very briefly. First off, a comment was made earlier, and it's very true. Engineering is a team sport, which means that this is not just about me, but it's about coworkers and others that I've been with for my entire career. If you think about how one goes about engineering a large major system, like an aircraft or a weapon, for example, it takes not only the mechanical and the electrical engineer, but let's toss in a chemist or a biologist. Oh, by the way, we need a lawyer, we need some HR people. It's really a large integrated team. And I would say in my own case, and I think true for many of us, not only was it a team of coworkers, not only was it a group of teachers and mentors earlier and throughout my entire career, but also a family. And I thank my wife, Julie, of almost 40 years for supporting me as I've won one step We've had some other conversation tonight about, about STEM and inspiring the young. Well, one of the things I learned a long time ago is that one of the best way to inspire others is to tell stories. So I'd like you all to pause for a moment and think about what it was that made you decide to have a career in STEM and whether or not your stories might not inspire young people to do the same. I'll tell you one story about myself as a child growing up. The guru, you, you actually set the stage for this. I knew I was going to be an engineer when about three or four years old. I got a Christmas train. And I could not figure out for the life of me why the train would not change directions when I moved the plug around in the wall. <laughs> and I, I knew it just had to be that box in the middle, but I was never really sure. Then I got a Tinker Toy set. And the first thing I built was an airplane. And so now there should be no doubt why I was not an electrical engineer, but rather was an aerospace materials instructor. <laughs> I knew that when I was only four years old. It was pretty obvious I was a bad time to going down. The other thing I would say about engineering, being a large team sport, is that you have the opportunity to work with very, very bright people. If I look at my own career, I spent my first 31 years at Sandia National Labs, and as we were said, I was eventually the chief operating officer and deputy lab director. Lockheed Martin had the contract to run the lab at the time. And then in 2010, I moved and spent five years as the head of the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, which was as exciting as you might imagine, as it really, really was. 
and now at the Academy. So I've been a member of the Academy for 50 years. I've been a volunteer for a long time. Now on the staff there, and what I will tell you between those three experiences, the people that I've had the opportunity to work with, the bright brightness, the smarts, their willingness to work hard, go together as a team to solve really, really critical problems, is something that's been an absolute pleasure. So I've been blessed with a wonderful life as an engineer. It's been a great journey. It's been a great story. And I hope you too can think about sharing your story with the young, young people to get them interested in careers in STEM as well. Thank you again for the honor. Thank you all. As you know, we have very distinguished uh, speakers, I mean, uh, awardees uh, this year. And uh, uh, Al just mentioned that uh, we have recognized the young people too. So we hope in the next year that we'll have a, an award which uh, actually honors uh, young researchers. And uh, you know, hopefully we'll do that uh, in the next coming months or so. Uh, now, how many of you are the members of Academy? And we hope the rest of the people also will be the members of Academy. So for those of you who are wondering what these awards are all about, I, I urge that you go to the Academy website and look at it and read about the awards. And these are for only truly distinguished people. And now we've got to kind of uh, come to a closure here. So uh, you're going to take over? Anyway, again, thank you all. So, Lynette Ladson, the secretary, outgoing secretary, and I have remarks here from the outgoing president, um, Mina Isdin. Is 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 <laughs> um, I would like to welcome the incoming and reelected board members and officers. You have what it takes to bring another year of success to the Academy. It was a great honor to serve as the president of the Academy in the past year. I am humbled that you placed your faith and trust in me. I would also like to take this opportunity to remember Peg Kay, whom we lost unexpectedly in September. Peg was a great supporter of the Academy for over 25 years, and she is being missed tremendously. Lastly, my heartfelt gratitude to the board members for their hard work and dedication. I look forward to working with you further. Thank you. And I will make my speech very short as we are really kind of wrapping things up. And um, I want to congratulate all the winners tonight. Um, very prestigious, very inspiring. And hopefully I look one day to be someone like you and have hundreds of publications. Um, it's been my pleasure to welcome you to the 2019 Washington Academy of Science Banquet. Um, it, I thank you for the privilege of being this year's Washington Academy of Sciences president. I would like to begin by congratulating everybody uh, for nominating the recipients for their awards tonight. And I'd like to thank our outgoing president, Dr. Mina Zaju, for her outstanding leadership over this past year. Everything we do at the Academy comes down to the dedication of our members. It is the strength and commitment to our science community, which is all of us, by the Academy's membership that makes it successful. I welcome the community of scientists, engineers, technicians, and other professionals who make up the Washington Academy of Sciences organization. The Washington Academy of Sciences is mainly about scientific innovation and discovery, and we have a long history that supports the scientific research community. Obviously, none of that is possible without the hard work and dedication of the entire scientific community. I want to express my personal appreciation for all the hard work that our board members, which I'm sitting right here, our current members, and all the scientists who are here tonight. I would especially like to welcome some of our champion and patrons who believe in the Washington Academies of Sciences. We'd like to thank American Association for the Advancement of Science, General Dynamics Mission Systems, National Science Foundation, National Institute of Standards uh, and Technology, NIST, United States Department of Commerce, and the Smithsonian Archives. 
The primary function of the Academy is to promote science through synergistic activities and to remind us of our shared stake in science and research. Science is more essential for our prosperity, security, health, environment, and our quality of life. The foundation of the Washington Academy of Sciences stands as a testament to the restless curiosity of boundless hope to the American scientific, scientific enterprise. As our founding father, Alexander Graham Bell, once said, educate the masses, elevate their standard of intelligence, and you will certainly have a successful nation. Thank you for all your past, present, and future discoveries. May God bless you, and may God bless America. Thank you. Thank you.